Well, greetings once again, my friends, my fellow modelers, my fellow historians, and my fellow lovers of everything interesting. I'd like to welcome you to another video, and today's video is going to be on the German battleship Bismarck. Before I begin, I just want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Alan. My friend Alan is actually making the Ravel 1350 Bismarck, and he's got the Pontos details set, and it's coming out really, really cool. So I want to give a shout out to uh, Alan over at his channel, Commodore Urban, and he's doing a really cool job. So keep up the good work, buddy. Today I want to focus on a... Um, I've got different go-to books that I've told you guys in the past, like when it comes to Titanic and other books that I have. And one of my childhood heroes is Dr. Ballad. So when it comes to him, I see him as an authority. He's the one that found the Titanic, and he also found the Bismarck. So I want to explain some of the, um, well, I want to tell you about his book, The Bismarck by Dr. Robert Ballard. And looking at Alan um, with his progress on his battleship Bismarck model uh, made me think about this and this is the trumpeter 1 200 scale now i have shown you this model and i've got so many projects going on right now that um i just i don't have time to do this one but i have shown you another model kit in 1350 scale and that would be the one with the motorized turrets and i have um a smaller one that i had gotten to practice on for doing the uh the camouflage but Anyway, I want to talk to you guys about the book. So why don't we go over to the desk where there's more room and there's more light, and I'll talk to you guys about Dr. Robert Ballard's book when he found the German battleship Bismarck. Okay, so when it comes to models of the Bismarck, this is the one that I was showing you guys or I was telling you about. The one that has the uh, the motorized turrets, the German battleship Ms. Bismarck with motorized turrets, plastic model construction kit, and this is in 1350 scale. The main gun uh, main gun turrets operate, and this is a I believe this is Lindbergh. Yes, this is kit number 762M, and you can see how you can program it to do different uh, courses. But anyway, I had gotten this um, to make a model of Bismarck after I had seen when um, Dr. Ballard had found this ship. So I, I thought, you know, that'd be a pretty cool model. And I want to do it with the, uh, the camouflage. The one that I had shown you for the 1250 scale was actually a gift from my wife. And she had gotten me that model kit. So that, would, that one made this one kind of obsolete. And this one, as cool as it is with the motors and everything, it doesn't really have the detail that the trumpeter does. But like I said, I want to do it with the, uh, the camouflage. I had gotten this model not that long ago. And incidentally, this is motor driven as well. The battleship, German Navy Bismarck battleship. And I had gotten this. This is Key Tech. And if that name sounds familiar, I have shown you the Titanic that they produced that was motorized. As a matter of fact, when it comes to Key Tech, the one that I really wanted to get to show you guys is I wanted the Enterprise, obviously. Um, but they were sold out. I couldn't find that one. Um, the New Jersey would be the next one that I was interested in, but it was sold out. So I ended up getting the Bismarck. And one of the reasons I got this model kit was because I had wanted to do the, um, the camouflage. And you could see it didn't go all the way up into the superstructure. But the, um, when it comes to this ship, I mean, she's a beautiful ship. She's a very formidable war machine. But all due respect to her, I don't feel the same way about Bismarck like I do with Titanic. I could have Titanic everywhere. Um, Bismarck is not one of my passions. Yes, she's a beautiful battleship, 
and very formidable, but yeah, <clears throat> she's not one of my, my loves, I guess, like Titanic is. Um, and so I don't really need a lot of Titan, a lot of Bismarck model kits around the house. First of all, I don't have the room. Anyway, I'm not going to ramble anymore. We want to go right into the book that Dr. Ballard wrote. This is Dr. Robert Ballard's Bismarck. Unfortunately, I don't have the dust cover. I ended up losing it. Or I think it ripped to something and it got thrown out. And this is from Chartwell Books. So, we open up the cover. And on the inside, you can see, I believe that that's the Bismarck prior to her launch. And there's a couple of things that I mocked off that I want to actually read to you guys and show you. You can see a ship, a picture of the ship, illustration of the Bismarck, and that's by Ken Marshall. And if that name sounds familiar, he just does phenomenal, phenomenal work. He's done paintings of, of Titanic and Lusitania and the undersea wrecks and, and Britannia. It just, he does phenomenal work. This book, as you can see on the bottom, madisonpressbooks.com. And this would be the 2007 publishing by Chartwell Books. And you can see the, uh, the ISBN number. And on the first page of the book, I mean, it was very sad. Dr. Ballard, he puts, to the memory of my son Todd, Alan Ballard, and to all those young men, both in war and peace, who have died before their time. You guys may or may not know that Unfortunately, Dr. Ballard's son was killed in an automobile accident. So, you know, we all have our pains. But that was on the first page. And as we go in to the contents page, you can see a picture. Um, it looks like, that looks like Adolf Hitler in the middle. And you have all of the, uh, it looks like, uh, let's see, Heinrich Himmler, I think. And Hitler over there. I'm not sure who the guy in the uh, the hat is, but anyway, this is the christening of Bismarck. Then we go to the contents page. We got the introduction, and that's really interesting. I want to read some of that to you. We've got the prologue, the pride of the Reich, our hunt begins, exercise Rhine, the opening moves, first blood. That would be the sinking of the hood, the chase, the final salvo, the hunt resumes. Bingo, The Finding, in Chapter 9, Exploring the Bismarck, Then and Now, Conclusions, the Epilogue, and the Index. We've got Hitler, Hess, Himmler, other Nazi notables look on as Bismarck's granddaughter christens the Third Reich's newest battleship on February 14th of 1939. Incidentally, I have done the uh, history of the Bismarck for you guys. And I got so much from this book. Again, Dr. Ballard, everything, all his information I have. I got, I recently got the Titanic, the ship Magnificent, and that is the greatest book series on Titanic I ever got. But I do have a lot of books on Doc, by Dr. Ballard on Titanic that have been my go-to for years. So I was telling you guys about this earlier. I really want to share this with you. This is Ludovic Kennedy, pictured opposite in naval uniform in 1941. He's the author of The Pursuit, Sinking of the Bismarck. And there is some interesting narrative, and I just, I, I gotta share this with you because of the historical aspect. Now this is from Ludovic, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, Kennedy. One afternoon in the summer of 1989, I was listening half-heartedly to the news on the car radio when I heard something which made me all at once turn up the volume and take my foot off the pedal. Dr. Robert Ballard, the announcer said, the man who had discovered the Titanic had now found and photographed the German battleship Bismarck. The Bismarck? The Bismarck sunk in 1941 with the loss of all but a hundred survivors. And in a flash, my mind went back 48 years to the most exciting five days of my life. 
For me, it started on the evening of May 23, 1941, when a Royal Navy Reserve Sub Lieutenant, I was officer of the watch on the bridge of the fleet destroyer Tartar. At the time, we were escorting the old battleship Rodney westwards from the, from the Clyde across the Atlantic. It was, as I recall, a routine sort of watch, my main duty being to check on our bearing and distance from Rodney and alter course and speed as she did. Around 9 p.m., the buzzer from the wireless office sounded and a signalman of the watch, name of Parson Pearson, put his hand on the voice pipe and began hauling up the signal box. This was the time of day when the Admiralty sent out U-boat disposition reports, as we expected it to be that. It was prefixed, most immediate, with the ship U-boat disposition report never came from the cruiser Norfolk on patrol off Iceland, 1 BS 1 CR, 66.40 degrees north, 28.22 degrees west, west. the CO is 220 SP 30. Pearson, I said, does this mean what I think it means? Yes, sir. One enemy battleship, one enemy cruiser, my position, 6640 north, 2822 west, course 220, speed 30 knots. Thus, we did learn of the breakout, the Atlantic of the giant Bismarck, and her consort, Prince Eugen. Bent on serving the convoy lifeline that was keeping Britain supplied from North America with food and fuel and weapons. If this news was a shock, worse was to come when my servant called me in the morning. Heard the news, sir? No, he knew nothing that I was going to have. He didn't know that I heard about it. Hood's gone and Prince of Wales was damaged. The British Commander-in-Chief Admiral Tovey had set out the most famous battle cruiser and newest battleship to intercept the German squadron as it raced southwards along the Greenland coast. And this was the result. Hood, the most beloved ship in the Navy, the epitome of Britain and her empire, sent to the bottom with the loss of all but three of her 1,400 men. The Prince of Wales, with more than half her guns out of action, having to disengage because of damage, if this was the Bismarck, could do two comparable warships in 20 minutes, what couldn't she do against the convoy from America? In the middle of the following night, the Bismarck gave her pursuers the slip, and for the next two days, Rodney, our sister ship, Mishona, and ourselves bucketed about the ocean and villist weather in search of her. There were few occasions when I came off watch and I didn't find my cabin a shambles with books, wireless, and photograph frames strewn about the deck. The Bismarck was eventually found again, then crippled by a lucky torpedo hit on her rudders. On the eve of her final battle, we went into action. Stations remained there all night while the Tartar rolled and yawned in the wind, in the wind shrieked in the halyards, and we were all drenched in spray. What would the morning bring? Would Admiral Tovey, who had now joined us in his flagship, the King George V, order us to attack with torpedoes while the battleships engaged with their guns? I rather hoped so, for it would give me the chance to use my movie camera the only one in the fleet. Sadly, we were too low in fuel for such a high-speed venture to be considered, but we stayed to watch the final battle. First Bismarck, the ship which for the last four days had been in the very marrow of our lives, emerging from a distant rain squall, black, massive, beautiful, and most marvelous-looking warship that I or any of us had ever seen. Then Rodney and King George V deploying for attack, at ever decreasing ranges, pumping shell after shell into her, until an hour later the pride of Hitler's navy had been reduced to a shambling, burning wreck. It was not a pretty sight, but the job had to be done. Towards the end we saw for the first time the enemy in person, puppet-like figures running aft along the upper deck and jumping into the sea. Then like a great waterlogged whale, the Bismarck turned over and sank. And that signed. Ludwig Kennedy. I just, I had to share that. That was an eyewitness account to the actual sinking of Bismarck, the pursuit. 
So we get the um, Dr. Ballard. I lean forward to take a close look at an image from the ocean bottom aboard the research vessel, vessel Starella during our 1988 search for the Bismarck. And they had embarked in 1988, but they were unsuccessful. They would return a year later and they actually would find Bismarck. You can see a few before and afters. Lieutenant Commander Buchard von Mullenheim, Reichsberg. At the time he served on Bismarck, and at the bottom as he looks today. And you can see Hagen, Schempf, and I share, uh, stare at the video screens looking for some clue that would link the debris we are seeing with the Bismarck. And it goes into the first chapter is the Pride of the Reich. And this is all about the Bismarck, her creation. You can see the captain, the recruiting poster, Einstatz der Deutschen Kriegsmarine. Left recruiting posters for the German Navy prominently featured the Nazi battle ens um, ensign that was hoisted up the Bismarck's mast on a day of commissioning. Captain Lindemann reviews his men. Commander Oles and Lieutenant Commander von Mullenheim Reichberg. This book has so many amazing photos. But like I said, I've done the, um, the history of the Bismarck, so it's not so much the history of the ship that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, I just want to share some of the, um, the the recent pictures of her now. I mean, some of the pictures are really amazing. The Bismarck is outfitted at the wharf of the Blom of Vaz shipyard in the summer of 1940. And this is her captain, Ernest Lindemann. I mean, I know I've done the, the history, but some of these pictures are just so amazing. Look at that one. So let me go ahead and... They actually have a fold-out that I want to show you guys about the ship. So when it comes to the... Um, and again, you got a couple of more amazing pictures. You can see the radar guns. It's just very, very formidable war machine. I want to make sure I don't tear the book. I'm holding it awkwardly. Yeah, let me show you guys the... the diagram of the ship. You can see the interior uh, profile, the officer's crew, the armor protection, stores, turbines, boilers, uptakes and intakes, the armament, the fuel storage, the gunnery controls, the water storage, ship controls, the workshops, tunnels and passageways. And they also have an aerial view show you guys. Okay, let's do it the same way. We'll do it from bow to stern. You can see the deck, the main guns, fly over the tower. You can see the um, all the different lifeboats going all the way back to the stern. Some of the photos, and start 
there. You can see the, the stern. Interestingly, the stern, when they found the ship, there's 50 feet of the stern that's actually missing that they think was sheared off during the sinking of the ship. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna show in this section, we, you can see the plane, a pilot, perches above the cockpit of his Arado 196 reconnaissance plane as it's hoisted back on board after a test flight. And this is Fleet Commander Admiral Gunther Lutjens in the pose that captures his forbidding presence. All right, so now I wanna to go to the search. So Dr. Ballard, in 1988, the hunt begins aboard, look at that absolutely beautiful vessel, the Starella. And this is Dr. Ballard in 1988. I look out from the deck of the Starella right as we depart July of 1988. You remember this is three years after Dr. Ballard found the RMS Titanic. Transponder is launched from the stern of Starella. You can see the sonar. The diagram shows how the transponder network or net enables the Argo to navigate we precisely along the ocean floor. The small fish, a polywog, towed just below the ship is a sonar receiver and transmitter that indicates the transponders on the bottom, uh, excuse me, communicates with the transponders on the bottom. These, in turn, communicate with a transponder attached to the Argo's cable. Just above the vehicle, the yellow squares underneath Argo indicate the area is covered by the vehicle's three video cameras. And you can see the transponder disappears below the surface and the polywog is lowered from its crane. So the first time they set out for Bismarck, they do find a ship, but it's not Bismarck. It's actually a very old vessel. They can tell by the, uh, the rudder that they found it was actually teak. And I got so many things I would love to show you in this book, um, but it would just, the video would be so long. This is the, the rudder that they had found. The sight of the teak rudder ended any possibility that the wreck we had found in 1988 was the Bismarck. The four mounted pins that attached to it housed are clearly visible. And let me show you the ship that they think this came from. This type of vessel right here, the four schooner, four masted schooner. A four-masted Inca-class sailing schooner from the early part of the century is similar to the ship we had found. And you can see some of the photos. And again, I'm not going to go off into that. That's a different subject, really. So it goes into the exercises now. This is after the Bismarck has been commissioned. Um, the exercise Rhine, the opening moves, and this photo was taken from occupied Poland in May 19th of 1941. Let me show you this will be a good way to break it down. So a map showing the route of the Bismarck and Prince Eigen from Gdynia to Bergen. The two ships rendezvoused off Rugen Island and then proceeded through the Danish islands into the, the Katat, where they were sighted by the Swedish cruiser Gotland. A second sighting took place off uh, Christiansen and near Bergen. Both ships were spotted by a British Spitfire. Okay, then we get to First Blood. Let me show you guys the HMS hood the depiction. And the hood in her own right is a very beautiful ship. 
And of course, she's much older than the Bismarck. All right, let's see. So, let's see. This picture. Uh, Bismarck salvo viewed from two different angles during the battle with the hood. The battleship is moving at high speed as the large bow wave and thin stream of smoke from her funnel on a topmost photograph at, uh, attest. That's an amazing picture. Turrets Caesar and Dora fire on Prince of Wales. So I believe those are the two aft gun turrets of Bismarck. We got another amazing illustration. Behind the Prince Wales, the hood bow just upwards from the force of the explosion in her magazine. Bismarck had fired and hit hood, penetrated through, and the explosion of the shell actually ignited all of the, the gunpowder in the hood, and it ended up just we're literally tearing the ship in half. And speaking of that, you can see how the hood was just totally devastated. Three stages of the destruction of the hood. One, the 15-inch shell from Bismarck penetrates the lightly armored deck and ignites the ammunition magazine. Now remember the um, the hood, the, the armor, or the decking was not as thick as Bismarck's. Two, an exploding fireball erupts from the ship and the pillar of fire shoots into the sky. And three, the ship breaks in two and quickly sinks. Of course, that's after the, ignition, the uh, ignition of all the ammunition deep in our decks. So let me show you guys briefly the map of the chase. The map showing the route from Bergen to the Denmark Strait with the inset showing the disposition of the two British and two German ships during the sinking of the hood. And this is a, I like this picture, the HMS hood with the crew. Of course, that was the flagship of the British fleet. So now the chase is on. And the British Navy is out to get the Bismarck. And this is the HMS Rodney. Battle heavy seas and races to intercept the Bismarck. This map shows the pass of the major players in the chase for the Bismarck after the sinking of the hood. The in, the in sows the major moves the part of the Bismarck and their pursuers leading up to a final battle. Prince Saigon was detached from the Bismarck on May 24th. Okay. Let's go to the, move the tweezers. All right, let's get to the sinking. Again, this book is totally packed with information and I really could go through every single page with you guys. But the, uh, the time, I don't want this to be a, a six hour video. I mean, as it is, it's gonna be long. Look at the uh, King George the five, the fifth. I, I love the four gun turret. I think that is so cool looking. Admiral Tovey's flagship, the King George the fifth, steams into battle with its big 14 inch guns ready to fire. And look at that with the four of them on the turret. The forward four gun turret on King George the fifth. Turret Caesar fires at, uh, a salvo. 
So these pictures are just amazing. It makes you wonder how they actually had the technology or the people around with the camera to snap these shots. You can see another illustration of Bismarck firing and being pummeled. And again, another amazing illustration. All right, let's. Now, okay, I'm gonna. I'll keep up with the. Okay, now we see. You can see the map where King George V, victorious, repulse. Rodney and the King George Strait in Norfolk, which had been shadowing Bismarck. The Rodney opens fire on Bismarck, destroying the King George, uh, followed by King George V at 8.48. Bismarck returns fire at 8.49 as Norfolk turns away. At 9.17 a.m., the Rodney drops out of position behind the King George V and closes in, firing on the Bismarck. The burning Bismarck fights on, but her salvos are intermittent and inaccurate. The Norfolk loops back by 9.40. The Dorsetshire arrives on the scene. And on May 27th at 10.22 and 10.39 a.m., at 10.22, the British cease firing. Dorset Sire closes in, fires her first torpedo at 10.29, crosses Bismarck's bow, and then at 10.36, fires another. At 10.39, the Bismarck sinks, and the Dorset Shire stands by to pick up survivors. But after seeing a reported U-boat, the Dorset Sire would leave and leave a thousand men, German soldiers, in the water at the time. The photograph shows the sea of heads floating in the oily water just after the Bismarck sank. For some reason, a British censor has blotted out most of the faces. Of course they did, because the Dorsetshire ended up steaming away while there was still over a thousand men in the water. And that is the Dorsetshire. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Dorsetshire was one of the two British ships that rescued survivors. And she's a beautiful ship in her own right. And this is a haunting picture. Bismarck survivors struggled to reach the safety of the Dorsetshire. Many were too injured or too exhausted to pull themselves up. The ropes thrown over the side. And you gotta keep in mind this is May, and the water is still very frigid in the northern Atlantic. So the effects of hypothermia would eventually take over. Okay, so the Bismarck is gone. Dr. Ballard is going to re resume his search in 1989, and he's got a different ship this time. You can see the, a smaller picture. The Star Hercules at the wharf, the Cat at Harbor. And this is the broad after deck of the Star Hercules, housing the village of Vans we nickname Venice. These research vessels are just amazing. Between the, uh, the vessels and the equipment, You can see Dr. Ballard, him and Hagen, and I wonder if our luck will be better this year. It would be. And some of the equipment. Tony Chu and I watched from the raised platform as the stern of the Argo is hoisted up from the fantail up toward the A-frame. Frank Smith 
attends to the barbecue at the cookout in Venice's town square. Rick Latham and Hagen Schempf. Tom Cook measures cable prepar preparatory for the transponder launch. The pilewag is lashed to the deck in the foreground. And Tom Cook sent tests a transponder before launching it. <clears throat> Skip Gleason and a deck crew begin an Argo launch. What an amazing job that must be. Martin Bowen winches Argo out over the stern and as another lowering of it begins. A plastic model shows how shapely Bismarck's lines contrast to those of modern day workhorse, the star Hercules. They're both beautiful ships. Okay, here it is, bingo. You can see the photograph that captures the moment in time. I point out some wreckage on the video screen a few minutes after the discovery of first debris. In the foreground is Kathy Offinger. Jack Ma sits beside me. At the end of at the end is Kirk Gustafson at Argo's controls. A scene of quiet celebration after the discovery the first debris. Will, will this debris trail lead us to the Bismarck wreck? It is associated with the Bismarck or is it associated with the Bismarck at all? I ponder the cause of an avalanche of sediment we are seeing on the ocean floor. And that's a really interesting topic. Okay. 12 to 4 watch in the foreground is Argo flyer Billy Yunk. Behind me, a watcher leader Ron Bowen and the navigator Tom Cook. The first chilling image of a boot appears on our view screen. And much like Titanic, um, bodies disintegrate, the clothing disintegrates, and more so, the only thing that is left behind is leather. So that possibly could have been a resting place of a body and the boot is all that's left. And let me show you the diagram. This scale diagram shows the depth of the area we were searching in relation to the size of the Empire State Building, the Eiffel Tower. This also gives a good idea to the massive size of the underwater volcano that dominated our 1989 search area. That's immense. Well, immense is an understatement. Okay. Jack Marr and I look at the sonar printout while discussing whether or not to lower Argo back down to viewing altitude. And here we go. Look at this. Upside down on the ocean floor, one of Bismarck's four big gun turrets exposes us internal mechanisms that are similar to those shown in the turret. You can see the blueprint. The gun platform lowered to an open barbette. And this is upside down and because these are so heavy, as soon as it impacted the ocean floor, the guns itself got buried and the, um, this, the stations is four decks deep and they have stations for over 20 men in each turret. Hagen strains at the winch during the difficult night recovery of Argo. 
from the couch in my cab and I could, I could watch a set of monitors that showed me everything the duty watch was seeing in the control van. Look at this. It's historic. It's, to me, not as exciting as when we see the boiler of Titanic. Again, the Titanic is a lot more special to me than Bismarck is, but Bismarck is still a beautiful ship. Our first look at the Bismarck, the twin barrels of a gun turret still look dangerous and ready to return fire. A page from the navigation log shows Kathy Offinger's triumphant notation at the moment of discovery. I like that. I love that they share all this. And I congratulate the Discovery Watch leader, Jack Ma. It must be an absolute thrill to work with Dr. Ballard. And now, now that they found it, they go on to explore Bismarck. And a lot of the superstructure was damaged. The, uh, the guns are gone because when the ship rolled over, they fell out. Because the only things holding the guns into the turrets are actually gravity. And you can see the lowering of Argo. And the Bismarck is much further down than the Titanic is. I give instructions to Billy Yunk as he flies Argo over the Bismarck. I begin to dismember our model to match the wreck as Peter Shaw of National Geographic Television records the moment. And an anti-aircraft gun mount with one of its barrels missing. An overhead view of the anti-aircraft gun located on the starboard side below the aft fire control station. And guys, if these pictures seem amazing, James Cameron actually went back in 2002 and he just has some stunning video from Bismarck. Because don't forget, this is from 1989. The gear teeth of an open turret, barbette today. And the barbettes as they looked during construction. I yank the main mass off the model, which is beginning to look as though it has been through a battle. The remains of the stump of the main mast. The roof of the altar fire control station where Burkhard von Mollenheim Reichberg directed the Bismarck's final, final four salvos. The circular section is where the rangefinder telescope sat. Diagram top shows its location. Kathy Offinger cleans the soot off a survival suit after a minor fire in a storage van. The lens of one of the color cameras we installed on the Argo in a vain effort to get color video footage of the wreck. And they did that. As you remember, when he found Titanic, it was black and white, the first videos. A rope cross memorial made by Rick Latham. Because they remember, guys, they may have been the Nazis and they were the enemies, but this is still a grave site. Canudo Santos Silva works on the rope wreath. The completed wreath awaits duty at the memorial service. Speaking of the service, 
Captain Derek Ladder, second from the right, conducts the service in memory of all the sailors who went down with the Bismarck and the Hood. Flanking him are Hagen Schempt, Wright, and Rick Latham. A parting shot from the Bismarck team as the Star Hercules heads for home. What an awesome, awesome memory. People, these people getting to work with Dr. Ballard. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, some of the then and now Bismarck. Again, these beautiful illustrations. The robot vehicle Argo explores the ghostly hull of the Bismarck, which still echoes the sleep power shown during her launching in Hamburg 50 years before. And I've got another pullout to show you guys. The Bismarck today, a port side view. The swastika on the boat deck, starboard anchor chain laying in a small hole, in a shell hole, excuse me, barbette from Anton, uh, turret Anton, barbette from turret Bruno, port side forward 37 millimeter anti aircraft guns, blasted remains of the open bridge. Roof of the conning tower, turrets and 5.9 inch guns of the port side secondary armament, grid of the catapult ending in a huge shell hole on the port side, roof of the airplane hangar where launches were once stowed, roof of the aft gunnery, barbette for turret Caesar with a section of the crane lane across it, and barbette for turret Dora. see some more pictures the hatch on the stern deck lost its cover is shown at the right serrated circular base for the starboard crane okay and like I said there's another fold out and this is an illustration of the way Bismarck looks on the surface today On the back, there's some more information. Now, let's get this set up to show you guys. This book is just amazing when it comes to Bismarck, all the detail. overhead view of the Bismarck today. And then we have some more photos. Amazing pictures. This is a section of the starboard fore, uh, foredeck near the anchor capstan. Shows that the anchor chain is still there, but instead of stretching forward toward the horse pipe near the bow, it appears to be going downward, gaping into a, into a gaping shell. You can see that right there. Let's see what it looked like when the ship was launched. Another amazing illustration of where the guns were. The conning tower. The poor secondary fire control. That's what it looked like. Another amazing
amazing illustration. The actual pictures. I think that could be maybe a crane. The Ago shot of the catapult. I'm sorry, it's not a crane. Matches the area marked by dotted line on the photo below. So that's where the catapult would have been. And in the section of the ship. Look at that. anti-aircraft guns. They're still frozen in a position where they are straight up. And that would be what these were. Again, this is the barbette hole where the gun would have been. And there's a crane that's fallen across the hole. And that is the crane. stern, 50 feet of the stern is missing. This picture taken during Hitler's visit to the ship shows him standing at roughly the point in the stern swastika where the hull was broken away. And basically it's the conclusions. It, it, this is just an amazing book. Again, I could go on and on. Let me show you, I want to show you how the, uh, the Bismarck sank. As the battle wanes, the ship slowly sinks to the stern. Two, just before the sinking, the ship rolls over, and the bow points into the air. The four turrets and much other debris from the battle begin their descent, and the ship turns over the weakened stern, and with nothing supported, supporting it breaks off. Now fully flooded, the Bismarck starts its descent. With the air gone from the ship, it quif quickly rights itself and picks up speed to pl as the plunge continues. Perhaps 10 or 20 minutes after leaving the surface, the hull hits midway on the side of a submarine seamount and sets off a massive landslide. The turrets which have just hit before the fall are carried along the slide. The ship and other heavy pieces of wreckage that have landed in the vicinity are carried down the slope, the avalanche coming to a rest about two-thirds of the way down the side. For the next several hours, lighter debris remain down from the debris field, forming the debris field. A metal locker. You can just see some of the, some of the items in the debris field. So, basically, this is my main reference for Battleship Bismarck. This is by Dr. Robert Ballard. And again, he's one of my childhood heroes. Him and Jacques Cousteau are my heroes. Anyway, my friends, I think I rambled enough. Um, I hope I told you a little bit of information that you didn't know or may be curious about when it comes to Bismarck and even Dr. Ballard and who worked on the project. So my friends, until my next video, thank you so much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.